So we'll get started. Just a couple of things before we start. My name is Mike Yaley. I'm the director of the Lair of the Bear. Love to welcome you to our seventh week guest speaker program. A uh, couple of housekeeping reminders. We are recording this. So uh, you did check that box when you signed up. So if you don't want to be on video, please just stop your video and, and listen in. Secondly, we will have you on mute. Uh, if for some reason you get unmuted, we will, we will mute you back ourselves. And if you have questions as they come along during the, the conversation, please put them in the chat. Um, we'll have some time at the end for some questions. And so tonight uh, we're gonna have a conversation and our conversation is with Glenn Washington. And Glenn is the host and executive producer of Snap Judgment, heard on over 400 public radio stations nationwide and downloaded over 2 million times each month. Distributed by WNYC Studios, Snap delivers a raw, intimate musical brand of storytelling, daring listeners to see the world through the eyes of another. Before creating Snap Judgment, Glenn worked as an educator, diplomat, community activist, actor, political strategist, fist shaker, mountain hollerer, and foot stomper. Glenn composed music for the Kunststoff dance performances in San Francisco, rocked live spoken word poetry in Detroit, joined a band in Indonesia, wrote several screenplays, painted a daring series of self-portraits, released, released a blues album, and thinks his stories are best served with cocktails. And so now I'd like to welcome you to this conversation with Glenn Washington. Welcome, Glenn. Uh, thank you very, very much. Nice to be here, Mike. Well, <clears throat> Glenn, you know, storytelling, I, I think it, let's start from the beginning. Can you talk a little bit about how you got into storytelling and, and what brought you to where you are now? Sure. Um, I, I like to say that um, I learned storytelling the old fashioned way. Um, I grew up in an end of days, apocalyptic, white supremacist Jesus cult. And um, when they would, uh, we were in, 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 the, in the 80s, I was sitting there, I was a little kid um, in church and the pastor said this, I remember this very clearly, this is a quote. He said, Brandon, Brandon, if you think we're gonna make it through the 1980s without seeing the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, well, you got another thing coming. And it turned out he was incorrect in that assessment. Um, and, but when, and, but what was amazing though, what was amazing from a, from a story perspective is to watch that even though, um, when you say Jesus is gonna come next week, and Jesus doesn't show up, you got some explaining to do, right? And um, they would dance, they would, you know, thanks to your, thanks to your, uh, your prayers, your offerings, your concern, brethren, we've beaten back the date of the Lord's return. So you can all give yourselves a round of applause. You can all give yourselves a round of applause for, for saving the world one more time. And uh, they owe you a debt of gratitude. And brethren, that's why today more than ever, it's important that you send your tithes and offerings to such and such a place. When um, I had studied story in that sense at the feet of masters, and it was a horrible realization at one point that everything was a lie. Everything was nonsense. Everything was a, uh, a perversion of religion. And um, I, in a lot of ways, I fled. I fled this whole that organization. I, I actually, and I was lucky, I was really, really lucky um, I got to go and live in Japan um, when I was 18 and 19 years old and trying to, the best thing, this is the best thing for anybody holding any sort of extreme belief at all, is to go live in another country and try to explain your belief system in that language. <laughs> um, me trying to tell people what I believe in Japanese made me see it in a whole different light. Like, uh, what'd you say? Come over here, listen to this fool, say it again. And they'd laugh and they'd laugh and they'd laugh. And I'd laugh too, because it made as little sense to me as it did to them. Um, 
and it was uh, it was it was a re it was a healing process, but um and I can't I was I'm beyond grateful that I got to do that, but um, it did it gave me distance and kind of some um some perspective on kind of the crazy background that I had, and I think maybe some ability later on to use those tools learned at a very very early age for a different type of storytelling. And how did you vault that into a career? How do you turn that into a career? Um, wow. That's a whole different story. Um, so um, my, my background is, uh, I'm not actually, I'm, um, my Annie, I'm not sure if she's on the call right now, but she's a, she's a graduate of uh, GSPP, the Goldman School of Public Policy. She's the um, Cal person. I am a proud University of Michigan graduate. And, um, and I, I went to a law school there and my career was largely in um, nonprofit organization and policy development. Um, it was funny actually, when I was first getting married, about to get married, you know, I'm speaking to my soon to be new mother-in-law and she's like, what is it you do? And I tell her, you know, um, I work in nonprofit policy development and this, this, and that. She said, what? And I, you know, I, I, I help with, um, you know, to implement directives of uh, state and local entities. What? What do you do? What do you do? And I thought about it. And I said, oh. I tell stories. She says, oh, okay, I get it. And she wanted about her business. And I had, I mean, I had never thought of it in those terms before, but that's the truth. My job as um, nonprofit director or policy organization or ED of a community group, all that is, is telling stories. How do you get a children's center built or a bed at women's home constructed? You're telling stories. You're trying to find a way to tell stories, oftentimes to policymakers, and find what they care about and what you care about and try to make that little Venn diagram work, even with the, you know, the, the, the most um, cabbaged head, cooger, somehow, some way, they got a heart there. And that was, that was a whole deal about, you know, I didn't know I was trying to learn those lessons, but that was what was happening. And this is a, this is a strange story, but this is back in the day. This is early podcasting. And um, I was listening to an early podcast and they said, there was a contest that was going to be held by NPR. And um, it was Ira Glass and Terry Gross and a few other people say, and, um, saying that there's this contest to find the next person that's hosty to have a national show. Actually, they just didn't say nationals, but just to be who's hosty. And I looked and the contest deadline ended up being the next day. And so I called my little daughter, who was like two or three at the time. I, I recorded myself telling her a very, very inappropriate story. And then um, I sent it in to this contest. And I forgot about it. And about three months later, I got a phone call. I was eating. Um, I was, but this time I was actually working at the, um, the business school, Cal. And I was having lunch, I was at a Chinese restaurant, and uh, I got a call saying, you are one of 10 finalists nationwide for this contest you entered, congratulations. But I knew better, right? And I knew my buddy's a jokester. So I was like, all right, nice try, Mark. Click, I hung up the phone. <laughs> they called back and they were like, uh, who's Mark? And uh, do you wanna do this? Congratulations or whatever. And so, um, turns out I was one of 10 finalists for this contest. Um, and I, I, I want to tell um, people, I talked to a lot of student groups and stuff like this. And yes, I did. Eventually, I won this contest. But at the same time, um, I had entered, for whatever reason, just, I, I was throwing the darts at the board. At the time, I was in a screenplay contest, a music writing contest. Um, some kind of uh, a, 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 uh, a painting contest, 
um, a poetry contest, all kinds of different things. This is the one that let me in the door. Um, and I, so, I mean, it was, it was uh, and, and um, to make a, a very, very longer story shorter, um, I won. But this is a contest without a prize. It's <laughs> like, congratulations. What you're gonna do now is make a pilot. I didn't know from pilots, I, I, I didn't know what that was. But I'm gonna make an hour long radio pilot. And so me and my buddy Mark, who I thought was playing that trick on me, but by now I'd listed in, in, my, uh, in my corner, we, uh, we, made, we worked hard. We worked hard for a week, no sleep, no nothing. We're gonna make a radio pilot, it's gonna be awesome. It's gonna be the best thing ever. And we worked and we worked and we worked and we worked and we did it. We made this show, um, an hour long radio pilot. And I was filthy, nasty. I took a shower, I got something to eat. I was so done and thrilled and happy. Whatever happens, we did it, right? We did the best we could. We put it all on the table. I left nothing behind. Woke up the next morning and I got a phone call from the contest organizer who said, who said, you have embarrassed me. You've embarrassed the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. You've embarrassed NPR and you've embarrassed yourself. Click. And I was in a fetal position. I was like, what happened? What, what we do, what, what was that about? And, and it's an amazing act of professional generosity. There's a woman who, who kind of gave me my first professional listen, said, hey, you know what, you're a good storyteller, but you're, you know, you're a crappy radio producer. I'm not a radio producer. Well, okay, 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 okay. So she gave me some notes, we fixed back this, you know, we did what we could, we put the show back out. I still, to this day, don't know what that phone call was about. I do know that a few months later, I got a call back saying that they asked me to come to DC and pitch a, a radio show. And that's kind of the beginning of Snap Judgment. Um, and yeah, that, that's, kind of, that's how it started. And um, <laughs> it's been a ride since then. And can you talk about Snap Judgment a little bit and kind of for those who aren't familiar with the podcast or the show? Sure, Snap Judgment, um, we call it storytelling with the beat. It's, um, it's, we try to make uh, movies of the mind. We call it cinema of sound. We want to put people in someone else's shoes and let them see the world through someone else's eyes. It's really immersive first person storytelling that hopefully grabs you by the throat and doesn't let go until the last line. When some, I, I love it. We have these, these um, cards and letters all the time. People say, I had to stay where I was because I had to find out how it ended. I want to know how it ended. Where was the ending? Oh my God, how did it end? And I love that. And um, the idea really behind Snap is that it's hard to hate someone if you know their story. And I think right now, especially more than ever, um, what's missing from our national dialogue is empathy. And um, Snap, tries really, really hard so that even if you don't necessarily agree with what the person did, at least maybe you come away with an appreciation of why they did it. And that's really the show. So when it comes to storytelling, what are the key elements to telling a good story? Um, to take out all the boring parts and only keep the interesting parts in the story. Um, <laughs> but, um, and honestly, I, I, I kid when I say that, but it's really true. Um, the, I, you know, the, the most important thing I think about telling, when you want to go tell a story is what's the clay you're working with. And the clay is a life that has been, you know, with some chances taken, some, um, some things might've happened. I got lucky in that it was handed to me. Um, I was, I grew up in this crazy cult on a farm in the middle of nowhere, um, thinking that um, some of the people in my organization went to sleep at night 
with their boots on because they were sure that Jesus was coming come in the middle of the night and they wanted to be ready. Um, and the, the, the journey out of that organization into some sort of semblance of, of just getting um, my mind right, I think in a lot of ways is a story in and of itself. Um, but I think too, you know, you know people, there's certain people you don't want a story from because they haven't really done, lived uh, anything. Um, and there's others that have really crammed a lot of life, a lot of living into the life that they have. Some people, you don't have to be old um, to really be um, out there pushing uh, experiences. You know, it's, and, that's, and it's really about distilling storytelling at its heart is distilled life. You're trying to distill life. And, and you know, it's always, you know, the, the, the kind of the, the thing we always say is that, you know, endings are inventions. You can put an ending on a story, but um, either the stories never end or they always end in tragedy because it's with someone's um, demise. You, you, you're looking for these through lines. You are, um, only the, you, you tell stories, the way you learn how to tell stories is by telling stories um, and listening to people who do a great job of it. The best storytellers right now oftentimes are comics. Um, you'll see right, I was, I was stunned that in the midst of our sort of national slow moving catastrophe, dual catastrophe, that the person who spoke to it most eloquently of late was a comedian. Um, David Chappelle kind of, he, he just, and it wasn't even funny. His rant on what was happening right now wasn't funny. It was a story. It was, a, it was the closest thing that I've heard from, to, from anyone politician, leader, clergy, whatever it may be, that kind of tie together what we're all experiencing to get right now in a narrative. And I know it was really powerful for a lot of people. Um, and it wasn't funny. To, I mean, and for David Chappelle not to be funny, he has to work at it. But it was still really, really moving and really, really powerful. I've seen the same thing with a lot of, you know, like, um, but Trevor Noah has done a really, really good job at sort of capturing the zeitgeist, which is interesting because his, he was born and raised in a different country. I think he's got his finger on the pulse of America in a whole different way. Um, and, um, you know, and Colbert, it's, it's just, uh, it's funny right now in the midst of all of this stuff that the people who are making the most sense are comedians. I don't know why. Kind of along those lines, and who are your idols? Who who did you grow up listening to and and wanting to emulate? You know, my I grew up listening to um, Bill Cosby talk about Noah, um, and <laughs> Bill Cosby, in large ways, was my hero. I, Fat Albert, I loved all that stuff. Now, of course, Bill is not the biggest person to be calling your idol. But at the time, that was, he definitely, um, his construction of what a story was, was huge for me. Um, and it was, and, and um, I think that in, a lot of times music was really important as well, though. You know, um, we call, Snap Judgment, we call it storytelling with the beat. We really try to make sh this show musical. Um, it's scored, an original soundtrack from start to finish. Um, is created. It's like a, a new album for every single show, which is nuts, but it really helps drop people into story. Um, it's something that was really important in the beginning. I'm so glad that we, we stuck to our guns with that. Um, it's been really, it's, it's been really powerful to have it work in sort of a dual narration where a person is talking, but the, the soundscape is telling you a story at the same time. And um, 
I, I think it gives a real cinematic feel to the show. And um, yeah, I, I dig it. One of the things I, um, though, some, um, I, I think if you haven't heard of Snap Judgment, you can get it on podcasting or, you know, listen to it on your radio, or whatever. One of the shows, though, people might not have heard so much here in the States yet, but it's called Have You Heard George's Podcast? It's a, it's a newest show. Um, now it's distributed by the BBC out of the UK. And what this dude does is pretty amazing. It's a, it's a very, it's a reworking, I think, of this whole interplay between music and story. And it's just sometimes just brilliant. It's just brilliant. It's so brilliant that I want to scream that I didn't do that. Um, you know, when you find an artist who loves so much that you're mad that they're smarter than you, this happens to me every single time I listen to that show. Um, it's an amazing show sometimes. And how do you guys find your stories that you're telling on Snap Judgment? Well, this is funny. Um, when I first started Snap, uh, I got to talk to my hero, Ira Glass, right? It's Ira Glass. And he's like, he's like, what, what are you guys doing? <laughs> and we're like, we're going to try this show. This is what we're going to do this thing. He's like, well, uh, you're not going to move for the next two years. So um, I hope you've got some interesting friends. Um, I really do to get you over the first two years. I hope you've got some interesting friends. And thank God. I did have some interesting friends who had the most ridiculous group of stories of all time. And being able to draw on that immediately gave us space really to create the show. Um, it's the, these, this, this kind of, this group of, um, ridiculous, um, misfits really found a home at Snap and, um, really made the culture of the show. And most of those misfits stuck around and they're still with us in one way, shape or form. And it's, I, I love that. I love the community that's come out of this show. It's been really amazing. And it's just, it's the best thing about it. Um, Snap, there's a, there's a live show that we do. And I love it. I, I think it, I love it so much. I, what, what the greatest thing in the world for a storyteller is to be backstage with a bunch of other storytellers, musicians and comics or whatever because when they start telling, everyone's got trying to top the other person. Everyone's trying to say, all right, you got a story, well, let's, you won't believe what happened to me. And I really wish sometimes I had taped some of those backstage conversations because they are so, sometimes so ridiculous, sometimes so sad, sometimes so hilarious. But um, when um, storytellers are performing for other storytellers, it's sometimes magic. Hey, just to remind people, please uh, ask questions in the chat. Uh, we will get to those at the end. Um, you talked about, you know, you're in a podcast or on the radio. How does storytelling change in different mediums, whether it's a live audience or it's written uh, or heard? How does, it, how does it alter in different mediums? Um, you know, it, it, you're definitely trying to play to an audience. I, the, the thing about... Um, a live show is that live storytelling it's a duet it's a um you know the, it's a it's a everybody's got a part to play the audience has got to put their part in we have a band that plays with us and the, the storyteller and this whole alchemy of things is going on and it's awesome and wonderful and live and real and urgent and it feels like a tightrope act sometimes because the person the, the storyteller might be pushing it in some ways and but um you don't get all that on the weekly show i have to like you know, the comics but we do um 35 brand new episodes of snap judgment a year and comics you know they will tour with the same 
uh, you know, say 30 minute set and they will tweak it and work it and take stuff out and put stuff in. And they will work that thing over and over and over again until they get it just right. They get that tight 30 that they know is going to kill. And I envy them because at the beginning of every Snap Judgment episode, I tell a story. And I'm telling it to a microphone. I'm telling it to a couple producers now who are in pandemic distance, sometimes on the other side of the planet. We got the microphones going on and they're trying to be quiet or whatever for recording purposes. And the, you don't feel the feedback. You don't, you're not in that feedback loop. And that feedback loop, as it turns out, is really, really important. In a lot of ways though, I mean, as a writer, I feel very fortunate. If most writers, they will spend a year, year and a half, write a book. It takes another year, year and a half, to get that book published. And at the end of three years, they hear people liked it or they hated it. It's a three-year feedback loop. For comedians, storytellers, and live, it's an instant feedback loop. The way that we work generally, it's about a week. Um, I think it's awesome. I think I wrote something cool. Maybe I did. <laughs> and maybe I didn't. Um, and people, as you know, in our social media world, they will let you know either way. They'll let you know, especially if it sucked, they can't wait to let you know then. Um, and all you can do is take it, take it, try to learn from it, pick yourself back up, and try again the next week. Um, one of the greatest uh, harms that has ever been inflicted upon writers and the creative class in general is that you're going to wait for the muse to give you inspiration. And then and only then shall you create whatever it may be that you're doing, writing, painting, singing, whatever it may be. And that noise has ruined so much. Um, so many people, so many artists, it really almost always boils down to, you know, pin the, get us getting it out, getting it out, and hopefully having someone in your world that can help you edit um, because it's iteration, 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 and first drafts are meant to suck. So someone who's not a storyteller by nature, you, you mentioned earlier that your previous career, you were a storyteller, even though you were creating policy and you were doing that sort of work. How can someone improve their own story, storytelling skills? Um, listen to storytelling that they like. Find um, a, um, a way. I mean, you have to hear an, um, a lot of stuff to to say, okay, I get what they're doing there. I understand what they're doing. The practice. Um, we don't think we can practice storytelling, but we can. Um, especially the lair, a lot of people have, they get built-in audiences and they're called children. And they will work, they will listen to you for money. Um, <laughs> but everybody needs an incentive and you've got one. Um, they're just, I just think that it's, it's one of those things that it's a muscle like any other and you've got to exercise it in, um, by both listening and, and, and telling and, and speaking. It's the only way to do it. Uh, and you, you've, it's, um, it's just so important to get out of your own way. And, and, um, and, and here's the thing too, here's the real deal. This is what's so hard about storytelling, if you really want to get into storytelling. The best stories that I've ever heard, the best stories that I've ever told, were oftentimes stories that I shied away from telling, stories that I didn't want to tell, stories that I had to reveal something about myself that was less than heroic, less than noble, 
less than beautiful. I had to, in effect, stick my neck out. And no one, no one wants to stick their neck out. And at this point, I've been telling stories on the radio for 10 years. And I still, still recoil from telling certain stories, even though I know better. I know that by leaning in, by exposing myself, that I'm going to, in fact, bring more people with me, that they're going to feel what I felt. I'm able to put them in. If I talk about my mother, you're going to speak, talk, think about yours. It's really, really true. And um, even it's just amazing that you can know this intellectually and still run away from it when it comes time to actually open your mouth and say what happened. What, what are some examples of some of those hard stories you've had to tell? Um, boy, <laughs> there's so many. Um, I'll, I'll just, I'll, just give you an, I'll give you an example um, that I can take a little distance from here. Um, I, one of the, probably one of the best performance storytellers on the planet, uh, a guy by the name of Don Reed, if you're in the Bay, he performs at the Marsh um, routinely. He's an amazing storyteller. And he came in and he was telling a story about his sister. And his sister had, um, and he told the story and he talked about her passing. It was a very personal, moving story. And um, she was transgender. And she was... Uh, someone took out revenge on her because in their mind, she was whatever. I don't know why. But he was told the story, and it was a good story. But I was like, I don't, and I was with my partner, Marcus. I was like, that's cool, but what happened here? What happened here? What happened here? I don't understand this point of the story. And it was a point that he was trying to avoid telling about. And he would, and finally he broke down and he said, when they came after her, I didn't protect her. I abandoned her. And he wept. He wept in my office like, like a baby. He, it was a flood coming out of him. I did not protect my sister. And we said, well, you know what? That's the story you need to tell. You know, it happens again and again that you don't oftentimes necessarily know the point of your own story until you finished writing it. You've heard that old saying, like, I would have written you a shorter letter if I had more time. Um, that is that the, the first draft is just that. It's, it's just throwing down the clay, making something that, that moves people is really about exploring the motivations and why people did what they did and why you did what you did and being open just to knowing that nobody makes the right calls all the time. Everyone has regrets. Sometimes things didn't turn out the way that you intended. Those are almost always going to be the best stories. So what do you listen to? What, what would you recommend? You know, what, 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 besides the comedians you talked about, what are some other things that you would recommend listening to in these strange and interesting times? Well, um, I think that starting out with the godfather of soul, I mentioned Ira Glass. I think that they that This American Life has really maintained its position for a reason. I think that they're just an amazing shop. They produce, uh, it's just some stellar work. Um, I, there, but there's, a, there's a lot of different shows. I, I mean, I think that um, the show Heavyweight is a stunning program. Um, I think that, that uh, there was a show called State of the Reunion 
done by uh, Al Letson. Just an incredible program. I, I love it now that a lot of storytellers are now newly taking inspiration from some of the serial episodic um, dramas of the 40s and 50s, where we thought we had lost that type of audio storytelling. It's coming back with a vengeance right now. Yes, that, um, some of you, there might be some comic book heads in the, in the, on the chat right now, but um, Neil Gaiman's uh, wrote his masterpiece, The Sandman. Um, that's like 20 years old right now. And people have been trying to make it into a movie or a TV show for years. And it just kind of resists that. It, it, it resists trying to put it on, a, on anybody's uh, screen. Um, and it, it resists a visual interpretation. Well, they just released an audio version of that, a dramatized audio version. And it's like, it's like the golden age of radio times 50. It's a romp. It's a story. It's just, they threw everything at it and it's wonderful. It was made for this. And it's on Audible right now, um, The Sandman. If you love radio storytelling, the old fashioned way, but um, in, a, in, a, in a newfangled package, oh my goodness, they killed it. They killed it. And I would really recommend that people go on up and check it out. Nice. Well, we're right up at about 40 minutes uh, after eight. Um, you want to delve into a couple of questions we got from the group? Sure. Uh, and we, we try and keep this uh, kind of as apolitical as possible. But Wayne wants to know uh, what your thoughts are on kneeling during the national anthem at sporting events, especially since with the Giants making the national anthem, I'm sorry, making national news by the manager and players kneeling? Um, what you, story does that tell? <laughs> well, I mean, you, you want to make it non-political, you ask me that question. I think... No, it doesn't have to be non-political, but I just, no, what story does that tell, I guess, is the question. I think it's a, a story it tells is the story of America. I think that, you know, we're, we're in a situation right now where you have a deeply, deeply conservative party and the other party and the, is batshit crazy. And the idea that it's not that protest, um, peaceful protest is somehow antithetical to um, America that, 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 that um, it just, it, it just it, now that John Lewis passed away uh, four days ago, and the idea of no justice, no peace, the idea that a man only not that old, 80 years old, still has indentations from having pipes swung at his heads for the, for the crime of walking across a bridge or sitting at a lunch counter. Um, that, and that, that this is not some historical legacy that this is part of what we're doing right now. I think that, I, I think that um, oftentimes sto like a story, is history. History is story. And if we don't know history, then we have dumb arguments about whether or not someone should kneel over um, as, as, a, as a form of protest. I think that that is a deeply, a deeply ignorant um, argument. Or, or it's either deeply ignorant or deeply callous because uh, and that's my real fear, is that it's not that they're ignorant when they argue something like that, it's that they know exactly what they're doing. And that we, um, and we were playing games with um, something that should be as natural to us as breathing water. Sorry. I'm gonna... <laughs> 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 That'll be a good, this will be a good story. <laughs> right, right. This is, the, the beep started happening. Just one second here. There we go. Um, so, I, and, I, and, I, and I do think, this is, this is another thing I will say, is on, I guess if you want to go into the policy, po political thing of it. Um, about five years ago, I was talking to Ira Glass from This American Life, and he said, you know what? We're screwing up. We are screwing up. We're messing up. 
I said, what's going on? And he said, um, we are in the middle of an environmental ecological catastrophe and no one's doing anything about it because they don't feel it. It's an intellectual thing that's happening and they're not, not feeling it in their heart. You only ever act on something that you feel. You don't act upon something that you just think or you intellectualize or you rhapsodize about. And we as storytellers are failing to make this, failing to make the heart case, the inside case for what we're losing in the climate change and um, ecological battle. And he honestly he couldn't have been more right. It's a failing that we've had. And we're trying to remedy it this year. We're, we're gonna be coming out with some episodes. One of them is called Gaia. And I hope that when it does come out that you check it out and see if at long last, we're able to tell the story of what's happening in a way that is not out there, but it's in here. We'll see. Bro, I'll give you a lighter question. Uh, this next one is, have, uh, have you ever done any improv? Uh, this is from Laura. Laura and I both have friends who've done that. And she says, I love that storytelling aspect. Um, <laughs> this, the crazy thing is this, Laura. Um, and this, is, this, is, this is the true story. This is ridiculous, and it's, but it's completely true. Um, because especially in the beginning of Snap Judgment, we're trying to have all, I'm, 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 we're killing ourselves. The, the first year, two years, three years, we're just killing ourselves to get, to create these new episodes. And we have a live show and another live show. And one day we were doing a live show in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And we we're about to start in five minutes, about to go on. There are 1,500 people in the seats and I'm about to go on and I don't have a story. I hadn't, I didn't know what I was going to say. No clue. And the band director, he's looking at me like, dude, you got to give me something. What, what, what do we do? What, we, I, I can't play for what I don't know. You got anything going on here. And I like was, I was about like, I, I actually, um, if I know what I'm talking about, I don't have a lot of stage fright. When I don't have any clue what the heck is going on, I am petrified, petrified. And so that was that case. I came up with a basic idea. I blurted it out to him. And 90 seconds later, the show was on. And um, so <laughs> I don't know if that's improv, but I don't like it. I don't like it. I like to know what I'm talking about before I say it. All right, well, that, that's the, uh, the end of the questions in the chat, but I, I do have one, one final question for you. Being a parent of, of fairly young kids, and I know there's parents and grandparents on this call, did you have a go-to story that you tell your kids when they're going to bed? No, um, they wouldn't stand for it. Um, what I did have was um, kids who I would tell them a story every night and they have to come the next day with a completely different story and the next day a completely different story. Almost for two, two and a half years. <clears throat> Sometimes they would want to revisit certain characters. Sometimes they want to, two lands to merge into one. Sometimes they had their own ideas. And sometimes, sometimes when I tell them a story, I say, okay, good night. It's like, no, 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 no. That was terrible. Yeah, dude, we need another. That wasn't a real story. That was stupid. Try again. And then, they're, you know, they're really good. Four and five, and they're criticizing my storytelling. Um, it turned out to be probably the greatest training for story of all time. Um, telling, coming um, with an original story for my children at night. And as much as I thought they had a lot of nerve, um, now I do appreciate them calling their daddy on his nonsense. Well, it's the first draft. It's just that. It was your first draft. That's right. 
Well, Gwen, we really appreciate you taking the time tonight. That was fascinating. Um, I, I think you'll probably get a bunch of new fans for Snap Judgment. We look forward to seeing what you're Burton putting out uh, as the years go, and we look forward to seeing you at the Lair next year in 2021. I miss everybody so much. The, like I'm here, I'm drinking this um, store-bought brew. When you know good and well, if I was at the Lair, this would be home brew, and I do not appreciate it. Um, <laughs> This week, this week though, um, <laughs> um, if you do get a chance, we're dropping this early. We're dropping this um, tomorrow. It's a brand new episode, and it's from um, we had um, extraordinary access to two different prisons, and um, we're telling stories about what happens when um, you have two thousand different people crammed in living with you and someone starts coughing in the age of COVID. And I think it's gonna be an extraordinary episode and um, to let us know what's happening with some, in some very, we're all having a hard time. Some people are having it a lot harder than others. I hope you check it out. We will, thank you, Glenn. And I uh, appreciate your time. Thanks everyone for joining us. Thank you. And uh, ha have a great night and go Bears. Go Bears. Go Bears. <laughs>